Okay, it's surprise time. All right. Actually, we'll just say it's Christmas time. I'm, I'm just saying. Okay, here's the thing. Um, we have an incredible team of pastors here at Crossroads. Um, that was your opportunity to agree with me. Yeah, 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 it's good. We have an incredible team. Um, we, um, in fact, as, as I think I'm still new enough where I can say this, um, that um, as a new pastor, and I'm not trying to, trying to say anything I don't really mean. I say this privately. I'll say it publicly. As a new pastor, I could not have stepped into a better, a better team than the one that was here at Crossroads. Grateful for that. Um, so, now, I also have this weird, strange belief, and it's not weird, it's actually biblical, but it's okay, some of that's weird too, um, that every pastor preaches. The Bible says in, in, in 1 Timothy 3, if you will, you know, I'm not going to have you turn there, just trust me on this one, you can check it later, but I'm telling you it says this, that every, every person who is ordained, one of the qualifications for an elder is not that they would be able to preach, that's not what it says. It says apt or able to teach. That is a qualification for every elder. So for the pastors here at Crossroads, every elder will step into what I just call, actually call it step behind the wood. Everybody is going to do that. Now for the church, you're pretty used to, you know, obviously you're used to me. Um, and, and Pastor Brad has been, well, you're not used to me. You're just comfortable, maybe not even comfortable. I'm the one that stands up here most of the time. We'll go there. Pat, you've seen Pastor Brad, but today... I'm excited to have Pastor Paul Cords come this morning and, um, and, and do this. Now, now, let me just say this. I'm not going to do this every Sunday, but when it's your very first time to preach on a Sunday morning, this is a significant day, not just for us, but for Pastor Paul. So he's been prayed over, but we're going to I'm going to have Pastor Paul go ahead and come up. We're going we're gonna to pray over him. We're just going to pray for him, okay? Um, I've already said don't blow it to him, so we're not going to say that again, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> And I, by the way, I'm passing that down. Um, he's bringing tissues. Oh, good. Are those for me or for you? But let's, um, let's go ahead and pray. And um, if you feel so comfortable and so led, would you just extend your hand out? Just to, I'm not going to have everybody come up here and lay hands on Paul because we'd never be out of here. But, 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 let's, um, but let's, just, let, let's just go ahead and extend a hand out. Let's, let's lift up Paul, that, that God would just use him as his vessel. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. God, and we lift up your servant to you. He's not our servant, God, and he's certainly not just the worship pastor or the executive pastor here at Crossroads. Um, God, he's so much more than that. He is, um, he is your tool. He is your vessel. And Father, uh, by your own word, you desire that all of those who have been called out by you to serve as pastors and elders, God, that we would be, we would be apt to teach. And God, there's no other venue for that than, than just to do it. So Father, I thank you for the message that you've laid on his heart. And um, God, I just pray that um, as you speak through him, and God, first of all, that you would tuck him behind the cross and um, let him just be there in the shadows, God, that you might be glorified and that you would be exalted and praised. But God, I pray that, um, Lord, the word that he brings this morning would be one that just is going to meet us as a church exactly where we are. God, I pray that you'd bless him. God, that you'd calm him. But God, I, I also ask that you'd give him a quiet confidence, God, just in knowing that it's not himself that he's speaking for. It is you. And God, because it's your word he's proclaiming, um, God, he can rest, not just in the finished work of Christ, but God, in the perfect word that you have given to us. So Father, we expect nothing less than awesome, not because of Paul, but because of you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Would you bless us this morning? Let this be a day that neither he or we ever forget. It's in your name we pray this. And all of God's people said, let me get my stuff out of the way because it ain't me. So it's all you, brother. I love you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, good morning, church. <clears throat> Again, as Pastor said, I'm, I'm Paul Cords. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossroads. And uh, just thanks for being here today. Um, just uh, it's a blessing that we're all together. And uh, just want to, again, say thank you. Um, as many of you know, I am the worship and administrative or, or executive pastor. And, and I'm, I'm responsible for the music that goes on here, but also the day-to-day the -day operations of, of what goes on around the church here. Um, when, when Pastor first came on board with us, and, and we did some interviewing and stuff like that, he had, he had said that you know, he, would, he would like for all of us at some point in time to preach. So I've been kind of tucking under the radar, you know, kind of <laughs> ducking here and there. Yeah, uh, I knew this day was going to come, but uh, well, here we are. Um, to tell you the truth, 
I'm nervous. I'm, I'm scared. Not so much about public speaking. I, I, I used to do quite a bit of, of public speaking and training um, in my former business. And, and so I would, I would teach uh, training classes to uh, construction workers and, and things like that, which was pretty easy because most of them, you know, were, were n and nothing against construction workers, you know. <laughs> I know. But um, anyways, it, was, it was, uh, wasn't, a, wasn't a, a, an extremely difficult challenge, mostly because I knew the material. That's the, the key in any type of, of speaking is if you know the material. Uh, but mostly I was, I was nervous because I want to make sure that I clearly expound on God's word. And I don't want to mess up. So you see, even big guys like me get scared and nervous. And I got my tissues because I'm an emotional guy. I cry. And <laughs> Don't worry, I'll probably have you out by 12 o'clock. We got a little bet going on between the pastors as who can get the longest <laughs> message, but it won't be me. <laughs> Woo. Oh, goodness. We're in trouble. Uh, over the summer months, um, there, were, there were four ch classes offered this, uh, this summer on, on Wednesday evenings, and, and that was also to provide education to you and, and training in different areas of Christian living. My wife and I had the opportunity of, of teaching and facilitating a class called Guarding Your Child's Heart. How many of you are child have, have children? How many of you have children? Okay. How many of you are a child? I would hope everybody raised their hand, you know, because otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. So, uh, and, if, and if you, we, we might need to talk later. But um, um, if you would uh, bring up my PowerPoint presentation, guys, and let's go to the, to the transformed slide. Transforming real kids into real followers. I, by the way, I stole this from Pastor Peter. Transforming real, real kids into to real followers of Jesus Christ. What, is that, what does that really mean? How, how do we transform our kids into real followers of Jesus Christ? And that's through teaching. So if you go to the next slide. Our introduction is preparing our children to live a life according to God's word doesn't happen by chance. Parents and even grandparents have the responsibility of teaching their children the word of God. We have an amazing task before us. We have lives that are dependent upon what we do. And all of us who are grandparents, parents, and, in, and even great-grandparents have this incredible responsibility in the way that we raise, teach, and train our children. Before Jay and I got married, we discussed many things. We, we had dreams and we had goals that we, we had in life, and, and we shared those things. But the biggest thing that we talked about was our family. I, uh, uh, I came from, from uh, a four in my family, and, and uh, my mom's family, side of the family, had uh, one, one, uh, one aunt and uncle had 12 in their family, and another had 13. So, you know, there, there was large families in our family. So... I had said at one time that, you know, I always wanted a big family, and, and I said, I'd like to have six. Kind of like the comers. Where's the comers? Yay, comers, all right. <laughs> and believe it or not, Jay was okay with that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, after two years of marriage, uh, we, we, were, we were still unable to have any children, and so we started thinking we weren't going to be able to have any children. So then we found out it was a medical issue, and, and we started uh, taking care of that through, through help through doctors and things like that. And, and then we found out, finally, we were going to have our first child. Well, there's something about us guys, you know, that uh, we always have, as, as a dad, you know, we always, we want a boy. That, that first child's got to be a boy, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Um... So I'm standing there next to Jay, and, and she's, you know, doing what all good mothers do, and, and she's in labor and probably thinking bad things about me. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the baby comes. The doctor says, it's a girl. 
Well, for about two seconds, my heart sank. Oh, man, I wanted a boy. <laughs> no. There's something about daddy's girls. You know? And not that Philip is not important, believe me. <laughs> I love my son and my daughter equally. Don't get me wrong, guys. I, I love you both. Just in different ways, you know? I just, you know. But there's, there's always that, uh, that daddy's girl thing. Well, daughter, my, my daughter, Corey, she, she was a happy, healthy baby. And uh, uh, I would say she's kind of like the, the perfect baby. You know, she, she slept at night. Uh, um, she, you know, didn't really give us a hard time. She ate well. Things, things, life was good. You know, we, we weren't, uh, weren't having too many troubles. But <laughs> then there's that but. That all came to a screeching halt when, when uh, our second child came along. Philip, Philip was, was, was more than, um, he was healthy for the most part. I mean, you know, he, he came around, he, you know, all, all his fingers and toes and, and ears and noses in the right place. And, and, uh, but, the, but the little guy was colicky. Oh, my goodness. We, we walked the floor for hours, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And we probably bought stock in the company that makes those gas drops. I mean, because we, we bought so much of that stuff. But... We were up all hours of the day and night, and, uh, you know, he was miserable. We tried everything that we possibly could. Everybody suggested, you know, do this, do that, do that. But uh, finally, he, he outgrew that. Uh, finally, he outgrew it. But that left a mark on me, and I said, well, we're good. We're done. <laughs> But uh, so I, I think, you know, we had the perfect family, and, and so we just stopped with two. But later, uh, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't know what I would have done without my son. He's, uh, he's grown into a, a fine young man. And so not only did we discuss the number of children we wanted, but we also discussed the manner in which we were going to raise them. Uh, we wanted to bring them up in a Christian home. We, we both decided that. We, uh, so we, we, we started to, to looking for a, a local church, and that's how we found Crossroads Baptist. At that time, Crossroads still met down in Riverdale, and, and so we, we got to, to, to experience that transition from Riverdale to here, and so we found Crossroads, and, and we love our home here. We've been here ever since. We also discussed how we were going to discipline them. We both believed in what the Bible says about disciplining children, uh, needless to say, we, we spanked our children. You know, we didn't beat them, but we did spank them. And actually, there were very few times that we, we had to do that, and, and especially Corey, she learned fast. <laughs> there was one instance where Corey got into trouble at school. Jay and I were both in agreement that she needed to be disciplined, and, and I gave her the choice of being grounded for a week or a spanking. She chose a spanking. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, it worked. After it was over and she had time to think about it, we sat down and discussed the consequences of what she had done and, and about making good choices. And that was really the one and the only time I really had to spank her. Um, she might need a couple now, but, you know, that's, that's another story. <laughs> uh, no, they're, they're both great kids. We also agreed that there would be none of this playing the parents game where, you know, one goes to, to a mom or then goes back to the dad. Well, mom said it was okay. Well, dad said it was, uh, you know, no, no, none of that stuff. So we, we both agreed that we would both be consistent in what we did. Parents, a word of advice to you, be together on this. You, you, you can't have it two ways. We're, we're, you, know, you must be in agreement. However, one thing we really didn't discuss or implement was how we were going to teach our children the word of God and his ways. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. Not because I'm an expert, but that I want to share what I have learned through this study and, and growing in, in uh, uh, my ministry so that you might learn from my mistakes. I now see that there were many things that I should have done a long time ago. So let's, let's, let's look at the, what, the, what the scripture says regarding training our children. If you would uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs 26, 22, 6. And now also stand with me as we read God's word today. I have one main verse today. 
but I will refer to, to many more as we continue, and I'll have those on the screen. So one verse, we shouldn't be here too long. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's pray. Father God, we, we come here today, Father, just honoring you and giving you glory for allowing us to be in your presence, allowing me to be here to, to, under, to, to, to give, relay the word that you have given to me. Father, I am humbled by this opportunity. Father, as pastor had told me a couple weeks ago that I was going to be able to bring this word, I, I, was, I was scared, but Lord, I know I can't do this in my own strength, so Lord, I have to trust on you for everything. So Lord, I pray that as I continue to to expound on your word, that you would speak through me, that you would use me to relay what you would have us to hear today. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this church family that stands before me. And I pray, Lord, that through what I might have to say today, through, through you, Lord, I pray that they would be able to use it in their lives and that we would grow closer from it. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again. And I ask all these things in the name of Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When I was in school, uh, specifically English and and writing classes, and uh, by the way, English and and, and writing were, were not my favorite classes, so here we go. We were taught that when developing a story or a report, or in this case, a message, that we should use six basic questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So let's start with the word what. And your your first fill in the blank there is teaching and training. The what here is, is the teaching or training of our children. So what is training as it relates to this verse? And let's put the definition up there. Definition of training, the action of teaching a person or animal a particular skill or behavior through practice and instruction over a period of time. We, 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 uh, we, we are commanded in God's word to, to train and to teach our children. Matthew 28, 18 through um, 19 gives us I'm sorry, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There's that teaching word. We are commanded to do this. There are, there are so many things in, in God's word where we are commanded and I wonder, how did, how did I miss this? And, and, and maybe, maybe you're, you're in the same way. How did we miss this and just ignore the commands of the Bible? This one is not optional. But we often think that, that God won't care or, or you know, we can just overlook things like that. So this is, this is a command that is very important when it comes to our children. You and I were trained from the time we were born and, and we'll continue to be trained until we die. We also begin the process, of, process of, of training our children when they come into this world. Sometimes it's, it's, it's reversed, though. Sometimes they train us, right? Thinking back to when Corey was a newborn. When she cried, you know, Jay and I would come running, and we'd, we'd, we'd uh, you know, come to see what the problem was, you know, whether she was cold or tired or you know, wet diaper, hungry, whatever the case may be. I mean, so, so she, in essence, trained us every time she cried. We'd come running. But as, as she grew, we began the process of imparting all that great knowledge and wisdom that we had of raising children. <clears throat> right? Yeah. So as a result of our newfound expertise, when Philip came along, we thought we had this rearing thing all figured out. Unfortunately, children do not come with an instruction manual, at least for the physical things of growing and developing. There are a ton of books out there on how to raise children. But not all the kids are, are the same, so most of the time it's trial and error. So the training process begins. We, we begin the process of potty training. How many, how many did that? Potty training? Oh, yeah. 
We get so excited when they go on the potty for the first, first time. You know, we, we even do potty dances. Yay, let's do the potty dance, all right. We train them to eat with utensils. I can remember sitting there at, at, the, at the, uh, the high chair with Corey, and I'd take a spoonful of food, and I'd go to, up to put it in her mouth, and I'd open my mouth just as wide. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else did that, right? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. We train them how to wash their hands, how to brush their teeth and brush their hair, how to tie their shoes, and how to get dressed. And then we start on the intellectual things, like the ABCs and counting to 10. Hopefully, it, in that process, too, we also add in how to be respectful and use manners. But the big question then becomes, why didn't I spend as much time teaching and training the things of God as I did on all the rest of this stuff? Maybe you did. And maybe you got this right. But I have to confess and I need to ask forgiveness. Of my children, that I have not spent nearly enough time teaching them the word of God. Told you I was going to need a tissue. After going through this study and also preparing for this message, I feel, I feel I have failed as a parent in the formative instruction of God's word, his ways and his truths. There is an evil, cruel world out there. And there's an adversary, the devil, which would like nothing better than to keep our children away from a savior. So what is my responsibility and your responsibility as parents and grandparents to teach our children the word of God? There are so many books and resources out there from psychologists and worldly professionals that tell us how to raise our children, but compared to the Word of God, it's garbage. Even some of the Christian resources are good, but where do you think they got their word from? The Word of God. The same place that we can go. We have everything right here in this book. So that brings me then to the why. Why should we start training and teaching our children the word of God? We are commanded to teach. The simple answer is, if we don't teach, somebody else will. And more than likely, it won't be in biblical Christian values. Just look what our children are taught in schools today. They're taught things like the denial of God by teaching evolution, they're taught sex education as early as the sixth grade, in some cases even earlier. Parents, it's our responsibility to teach these things, like creation and sex ed. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. We're the ones that are supposed to teach our children that, not the school system. Our children are being indoctrinated in the things of this world, so we must counter that with sound biblical teaching. How many of you came this past Wednesday night to see God's Not Dead? Or, or, or maybe even you even saw it in the theater that, you know, when it first came out. This is, is th that's an example of, of what these liberal college professors teach in our universities. They get all this kind of junk out there. If our, not, if our children are not grounded in biblical truths and the word, how can we expect them to remain faithful as they grow older? We have a very short time to teach our children and train our children in the word of God before they, they leave us. As I said, Satan would like nothing better than to keep our children in the dark and far away from the truth of the gospel message, as well as how to live a life that pleases God. But the main reason why we teach our children is that we are commanded to. Deuteronomy 6-7 gives us a clear command. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Diligently here refers to repetition over and over and over again so that they will never be forgotten. Things that we are taught through repetition are rarely forgotten. As a child, I learned my ABCs through repetition. We sang the ABC song, you know, forever. And uh, uh, counting by numbers, I mean... 
over and over and over again, we learn these things. And as a teen, and I'm not, not proud of this, but as a teen, my very first album was, was by Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. And, and I played that thing until I probably wore it out. It, and it was a record for those of you, you youngsters that know, don't know what a record is. <laughs> it's not, it wasn't a CD. And they actually had a record player with a needle. What's that, right? I played that record over and over again, and, and I can probably still s sing every single song to this day. Not that I would, but um, that's what we get through repetition. For those of us who had some, some church upbringing, like I did, I think we all learned John 3.16 as, as, a, as a child, and we learn that by saying it over and over and over again. So why is it so important to memorize and retain God's word? We live in a country where we currently have freedom to read the Bible and, and go to church. But what if that were to change someday? What if we lived in China, where it's illegal to possess a, a, a Christian Bible and, and go to church? Those people are so hungry over there. They'll take little pieces of, of Bible and, and read it and read it and memorize it and memorize it because they probably can't get a hold of a full Bible. What if that happened here in this country? Do we know enough of God's word where we could be able to recall scripture at any time? It's a challenge to me as well. Do I have enough scripture memorized? Another reason to memorize scripture is for recall. Recalling scripture is very important in battling against evil, but it's also used for encouraging us. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, we, we fight temptation all the time. And if we have God's word in our heart, we, we have that ability to recall and to be able to fight that temptation through God's word. But then also, Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. It gives also, also gives us encouragement. When you're feeling down or when, when, when you're feeling like you know, you're, you're uh, in trouble or, or you're, you're not worthy enough or, or whatever the situation is, we can rely on God's word. And if we have that memorized, we can recall those, those verses and that word uh, in an instant and, and help us to, to overcome that. By hiding God's word in our heart, it gives us the tools we need to fight against temptation, against evil and negative thoughts. During the summer study, we discussed the differences between what the world thinks and what Christians should think. For every worldly thought, there is a biblical thought or scripture to counter it. The world tells us to be prideful. But God's word tells us to humble ourselves before God. Matthew 5.3 God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The poor in this verse refers to poor in spirit, a brokenness, or as a beggar who is hungry for the things of God. Today's culture also tells us to love the things of this world. The Bible commands us to love God with all our mind, soul, and strength. Mark 12:30. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So we, can, we have a choice. We, we, can, we can love the things of this world, or we can, we can dwell in the love of God. Culture also tells us to take as much as we can and be users but we should, have, have to, we should have a love to serve others sacrificially. The world tells us, you know, get the, get the next biggest boat, get the next biggest house. Who doesn't care who you step on. But God's, God's word does not tell us that. We should love others sacrificially. Mark 12, 31 tells us, love your neighbors as yourself.
The world also tells us that trials are bad. But God's word tells us to rejoice in our trials and that all trials are good. I know many of us probably go through some type of trial on a daily basis. But it's how, how, how do we process that trial? Do we dwell on it? Do we, do we, do we pity, sorry, or just dwell in our sorrow and, and pity ourselves? Matthew 5, 10 through 12. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when, you, when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. I don't know about you, but it's hard to, re to rejoice in a trial. You know, when, when something bad happens, you know, to say, yay, thank you, God. But it tells us right here, we're supposed to do that. It's not easy to do that. But our whole attitude, our whole demeanor would change if we were to do that. We process thousands of thoughts every day. And as we take in thoughts, we have a very short opportunity to process that thought. Once we dwell on that thought for too long a period of time, it enters into our heart. And some of those thoughts are good, others are bad or negative. And depending on what we do with that thought could have good or bad results. For example, let's say you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. Maybe a bad thought enters your mind and you want to give them a piece of your mind. <clears throat> um, my wife, Jay, has a little road rage problem. <laughs> but, but she is doing much better, thank you very much. Years ago, even before I was saved, I had an incident where somebody cut me off and, and then, you know, the old hand gesture trade came and then, you know, pulling off the side of the road and an actual knockdown, drag out fist fight. I mean, I wouldn't do that today, but that actually happened many years ago before I, I, I was saved. But again, that, that's how these thoughts impact us. So we can take them, we can hold them, and we can process them and, and, and either re or, or, uh, discount them with Scripture, like maybe Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful. You know, we be merciful to, to somebody else, and, and we you know, just let it go and, and not worry about it. Or again, you can dwell on that thought and do something stupid, like I had done. Yeah, we sometimes make situations even worse by what we do. We've all heard the... Uh, uh, oh, I, I already did that. Sorry. Getting ahead of myself. So you see, recall of Scripture is very important for us to be able to handle the everyday trials we go through and live our lives according to God's Word. Being able to recall God's Word instantaneously will help us live the Christian life and keep us out of trouble, at least for the most part in my case. I don't know about you, but I can get myself into trouble in a matter of seconds, and I don't need any help. Another reason to the why question is that we love our children and we want the best for them. We want them to su succeed in life. But more importantly, is that we want them to have that close and personal relationship with Jesus and to live a life that is honorable and pleasing in the sight of God. There should be nothing more rewarding than being able to teach our children the truths of the Bible and lead them to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We should have a burning desire to know that our children will spend eternity in heaven instead of hell. I think that was one of my biggest fears as a, as a, as a new parent, is will my children ever have that saving grace and, and be, become saved at some point in their life? And, I, and I'm so thankful that both of them have given their lives to Christ. Hasn't Pastor been teaching on making disciples? Who better then to make a disciple out of than our own children? If we start there, who knows where it could go? 
If we as parents will do this and are able to pass to our children, and in turn they pass this on to their children, we have impacted future generations. It goes on and on and on. It's, it's what we've been talking about, multiplication. We, we, we take it to our children, they take it to, to their children, and, and so on and so on and so on until it becomes everywhere. And it's just not our children. It's, it's, it's your, your neighbor's children. It's, it's your, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, anyone and anywhere you, you go and whoever you meet. I briefly touched on this earlier, but the how should be sort of self-explanatory. So we're moving on to the how. We teach through memorization and by example. We teach through memorization to get the word into our hearts, but we also teach by example. I am, you are, and all of us are living, walking, and breathing examples to not only our children, but to everyone we come into in contact with on a daily basis. We're, we're, we're walking examples. What you do and say in life, people are watching you. Our children are watching me. My children watch me every single day. Your children watch you as well. And our children are basically reproductions of ourselves. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how we live our lives. If we live our lives in such a way that pleases God and our talk matches our walk, then we should be able to raise children that are a reflection of us. Again, our, ch our children watch everything that we say and do. We can't use that old adage, do as I say, not as I do, and expect our children to turn out well. We have to be the examples. We have to be the people who love God supremely and others sacrificially, and then our children will follow in our footsteps. However, if I were and you were to live two completely different lifestyles, where Monday through Saturday we live like the world, and then come Sunday we put on our Christian faces, how do you think your children are going to turn out? Most likely be in the exact same way. So we have an awesome responsibility. Not only do we teach by example, but we also must provide formative instruction. We must spend time in the Word with our children. With small children, teaching basic Bible stories and easy scriptures are a great place to start. And as they grow and develop, we can intensify the content. And as I said earlier, repetition is the best way to memorize, at least for me. Some of you may have other ways of doing it, but repetition is, is the way that I learn uh, to memorize. Also, starting a daily devotional with your children is very important. But it takes a commitment. Experts say it takes 21 days to form a habit. So if we are faithful and diligent about making sure we spend that time with our children, after 21 days, it should be no problem to, 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 to keep it going. To the point where, if you miss a time, your kids are going to come say, hey, it's time to do our Bible study. It's time to, to read God's Word. They're going to they're gonna want to do it because they're going to they're gonna feel something's out of place if, if it doesn't happen. I'm not here to promote any particular study as there are many to choose from, but be careful as to what you pick and who the author is. There are studies for small children all the way to the adult level, but make it fun, make it exciting for kids. The last thing you want to do is force your kids to memorize or engage in a Bible study, especially if it has not been a practice that they've started from a young age. What's the first response your kids give when you make them do something they don't want to do? They get mad, they get angry, they get defensive, they put up a shield, and it turns their heart against you, and in this case, against an openness of God's word. Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So keep this in mind when, you, when you're trying to implement a Bible study or, and, and start uh, memorizing scripture with your children, especially if they've never, never had that opportunity. You also may have a lot of praying to do. But we should be praying for our kids every single day. Before we hit the floor in the morning, before we do anything, we should be praying for our families, 
our kids. And that brings me to the when and where. These two kind of go hand in hand. And the simple answer is all the time and everywhere. Deuteronomy 6 talks about this as well. Verses 7 through 9, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So when you're just sitting around the house, watching TV, doing whatever you're doing, turn the TV off. Turn the cell phones off. Turn the video games off. Turn whatever is distracting you off. 15 minutes a day to start with. That, I mean, that's not much. And then maybe 30, and then maybe, and maybe it grows. But I think we can spend at least 15 minutes a day with our children, right? And it doesn't have to be an intensive at first. It could just be one or two Bible verses to, to start memorizing. When you walk by the way, that was uh, part of that uh, second ver in, in the second part of the uh, verse uh, seven. There, we don't do too much walking anymore. But every time we get in a car, we have opportunities with our kids. So, what are we listening to on, on the car radio? Is it talk radio? Is it uh, uh, rock and roll? Or are we just you know talking on our cell phones? But what a perfect opportunity! Whether it's going to school or maybe you're taking a road trip, or you're just you know, out shopping for the day or doing something. What a perfect opportunity. You have a captive audience. They're right there in your car. Long trips especially. I mean, the Bible on CD, or, or, or if you have an older car, Bible on tape or something like that would be, <laughs> would be, would be a great time to, to, to listen to the Bible. Or, or put on, a, on a, a Christian radio station and, and sing worship songs. Worship songs are on Way FM. I mean, what a great time to worship the Lord as you're driving down the road. Jay, Jay used to take a, a bunch of kids to school, and, and they'd get in the car in the, in the mornings and, and put on Kirk Franklin, and, and, and they'd be hands raised up in the air. People would probably think they're crazy going down the road, but hey, they, they were worshiping the Lord in the morning. When you lie down. So as you get ready for bed each night, what a great time to have prayer with your family. Or you can talk about the events of the day, problems you may have encountered, maybe even times of confession where maybe I, I failed as a parent and I, I didn't do something I was supposed to do or, or I let them down. But what a great time to spend with your children right before you go to bed. And just asking for their forgiveness or, or, or asking God to forgive you for, for where you failed that day. Or just praising him. What a great time to thank God for the blessings of the day. We have so many things to be thankful for. We are blessed so abundantly. So at the end of the day, take time with your kids and, and pray and ask him to, to or, or thank God for all the blessings that he's given to us throughout that day. And then we can pray for protection through the night. Ask the Lord to keep us safe through the night, that we would, would uh, be, be unharmed and, and that our homes would be surrounded. Through his, with his protection. And then also pray that we would get the rest that we need, that we could wake up and be ready for a new day tomorrow. We also pray for our lost family members at that time. We have, we have many in our families that are lost, and, and what a great time to, to lift up those who are lost. And then when you rise up, before your feet hit the floor, I thank God, for a new day, ask him for his blessings upon me, that I would walk close with him that day, and that I would do my best to be obedient to him. Ask God to guide your path and give you opportunities to share the gospel with someone. Also, the scripture verse for the day. Most of us have smartphones, or we have the daily bread available. You can read the verse for the day. What a great place to start. I find that when I do this, I can get more things accomplished, and the trials and difficulties that I'm going to face that, that, that are presented to me each day are much easier to handle. 
And when I'm able to handle those, that equals less stress. And I know that we can all deal with a lot, lot less stress in our lives. Doesn't mean that the day is going to be butterflies and daisies. But we can rejoice in our trials. Again, have you ever rejoiced in a trial? It may sound un unusual, but it is, it is a command. Romans 5, 3 through 5, and I, I read this earlier. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We can rejoice in our trials. Finally, we have the who question. Who is supposed to train and teach? Well, that's me, that's you, that's everyone in this room. You may be a parent, you may be a grandparent, you may be a great-grandparent. You may not even have kids. But as, as Pastor had mentioned at the beginning of the service, I want us starting this Wednesday night. Who, who better than, than us as adults to come in and help teach these kids? If you don't have kids, adopt a kid. There are so many parents or, or, or children out there who don't have a mom or a dad or single parents who, who are trying to do this by themselves. We have an opportunity through Awana where we can come and we can pour ourselves into these kids. Or Sunday morning, Miss Charlene could use some help in children's worship with, with the kids in, in there. Or Sunday evening, we're going to be starting back up Sunday evenings uh, now that school has started. And, and, and uh, Miss Stacy could use help on Sunday evenings. We have opportunities to pour our lives into these kids. And if we don't, like I said earlier, somebody else is going to. The future of the church is dependent on generations to come. We will never see a change in today's culture, and we may, we may never see it turn around. But if we want our children to be prepared for what is to come, and we don't know what's coming, we need to equip them properly so they can handle what is going to come. Now is the time. Today is the day. We can't wait any longer. It's too important of a task to put off till tomorrow. Our adversaries are already working to destroy the family and the lives of our children, and they've done a pretty good job of that so far. But it's time to stop it and to start our own attack against their advancement. If the government can have a slogan, no children left behind, why can't we have that same battle cry? I pray that God will burden us for the lives of these kids and their kids, and for the future generations to come. So my question to, to you, and even to me, is where are we with teaching and training in our homes with our kids? Maybe you were like me and, and getting a late start, or maybe you were a mom and dad with small children. Do you have a plan for teaching God's Word to your kids? If not, today can be the day that you start. Well, you might ask, where do I begin? If you need resources, the pastors, Pastor Brad, Pastor, Pastor Peter, myself, Pastor Mike, any Sunday school teacher that is here, we're, we're available to help you. This church is, is here to help. And I'm sure we'll offer this class again, and probably others as we move into next year. And if you have older kids, you know, middle age or high school age, our, our youth program, they're, they're, they're always there available to, to help your kids. We have a great youth program going on here. But we can't help if we don't know the need. If you're in need and, and, and you stay silent, how, how can we help you? We can't. So you need to come, with us, come to us and, and, and ask for help, or come to anyone and ask for help. Maybe you're here today and just trying to figure out this whole idea of Jesus and the church and the Bible. Have you ever heard that Jesus loves you? 
and that he died for you. He died for me. He went to the cross. And he willingly gave his life for you, for me. He gave it up. It's a gift. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's a gift. For whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But what do you do with a gift? You have to accept it. It's a free gift. Well, not free to him. It cost him his life. But he offers it freely. So maybe today you're here and, and, and you don't have this relationship with Jesus. So I invite you today, if there's never been a point in time in your life where you've turned your life over to Jesus, today's the day for you. Pastors will be down here in front. I'll be down here. We'd we'd like to, to be able to show you how the you can have that eternal life through Jesus Christ. Bow your heads with me, please. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to to share your word. I thank you, Lord, that you have used me Father, now I I just ask that if there's anyone here who does not have a relationship with you, that today would be the day that that they, they would come and give their lives to you. Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts, that you would speak to us, and that you would not let go of us until we've made a decision. But it's more than just a decision. It's a, it's a life change. It's, it's repenting. It's turning our lives around completely and surrendering our lives to you and living for you all the rest of the days of our lives. So, Father, if there's one here today, Lord, I pray that you would not let them leave here until they surrender their life to you. Maybe you're here today and you're looking for a church home. We'd love to have you. So, Father, as I continue to pray, Lord, I I just ask, Lord, for for those who maybe are in search of of a church family, a church home, like I was, that they would find this place to be their, their family, their church home. Father, I know that there's many among us who are who are hurting, we have needs. Father, I pray that you would meet needs as only you can. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we give you praise and glory for what you are going to do. For it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Stand with me as we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus.
Um, Pastor Paul, you available next week? Can we say thank you? Incredible. Love it. Love it, love it. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to have, I'm going to close this in just in a quick word of prayer. Please, one more time, let me remind you, if you have children are going to be uh, stepping into Awana starting this Wednesday, please uh, register them today. Help us be good to our guests this Wednesday, okay? So please get that done. We will expedite you as quickly as we can through that, through that process. Hey, as we close in prayer, God was just challenging me down here like in a 20 different areas, but this is what he burdened me with. Polite kids go to hell. Kids who get good grades, they go to hell, right? We need to remember this, because here's the thing. Here's what what my my takeaway from from this morning. If we raise our kids to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, and do really well in academics and participate in in maybe extracurricular activities or or, 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 or sports or, or whatever it is, they can do all of that. And if Jesus is just a slice of the pie, We can teach what we know, but we will reproduce who we are. Jesus isn't a piece of the pie. He is the pie. And let me just say this. All of that we want, here's the thing. I want our kids to be respectful and polite to do well in school because they love Christ, not because we've instilled it in them as some kind of value. We we have a children's ministry here at Crossroads, not to make your children polite but to introduce them to a Savior that whether they recognize it or not or whether we recognize it or not, they are in desperate need of a Savior. Because if you're lost, the greatest need you have is Jesus. Not to have a reputation of, boy, that child is so polite. Man, that child gets good grades. That's not enough. Saved people change the world for Christ and for his glory. That's our heartbeat. That's our focus. As we pray, let that, let let those things, let this message this morning just burden you today as you think about, am I gonna, am I gonna do family devos today? Am I gonna start something new, something different at home? I pray that there would be just massive changes in your house or there would be a a recommitment to things you're already doing. Amen? Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for, God, the incredible opportunity that you've given us today to, to come as a people and to worship and to praise and to sing of your greatness. God, you're worthy of all of it. But God, as we've been talking about these past several weeks, even as Pastor Paul has reminded us, the task that you have given us is impossible for us. You have told us to train up our children in the way that they should go. God, which implies we know the way. Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That no man comes to the Father except through me. God, I pray as parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, pastors, children's ministry workers, nursery workers, that this would be our burden, God, this would be our passion, this would be our drive. God, we don't want to see children walk away, step into student ministry, or walk away from this church, maybe go somewhere else. God, we want them to be equipped with the gospel. God, we don't want Jesus just to be a part of their life. We want Jesus to consume their lives, that they would live wholly sold out to him and his kingdom. So God, even as we lift up our children, that they would be saved and they would know you and love you. God, I pray for every parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, aunt, uncle, all of us. God, that we would be a catalyst to that end. Help us to do those things. God, that our children would simply see us with our Bibles open in our laps they would see us as we worship and praise because we are modeling those things for them even as we're teaching them. God, help us to do that. God, equip us and burden us to do that. Let us be a church that is driving every single day to that end. God, we love you. God, as we step away from this place, we're stepping back into the mission field. God, that we would shine because we have been in the presence of God this morning. 
We love you. We praise you. Thank you. It's in your name we pray. And all of God's people said, have a great day. We'll see you back here tonight.